because we can actually talk about a lot of different things. Um, and we're actually in a pandemic. So here we are. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to the pastor and uh, amazing gentleman, Reverend A.R. Bernard, who is the uh, pastor of Christian Cultural Center in Brooklyn. And um, he has some wisdom. I would love to ask him some questions about what's going on right now. Uh, love to get his take and see if we agree. You know what I mean? And it's okay. Uh, I just really want to, you know, someone that I trust, someone who's smarter than me, <laughs> that's for, for real, um, someone who can really, really speak to me about what's going on right now because, you know, I've been reading, I've been studying, I've been looking, and, uh, I, you know, I really, really want to find a solution, um, you know, my thing is, you know, in regards to race, in regards to what's happening right now, uh, my feeling and, and really deal is my love for black people, my love for, you know, my culture, my community, uh, but also my love for communities all over the world. Um, I have family in, of every nationality. I have family of every ideology and I have family of every race family in different countries from Brazil to Korea to uh, South Africa. Um, I have people who I call my brothers in every country in the world. So being that uh, I need to get some clarity on, you know, what's going on today. What are we going to do about what's happening here? Um, and just to get, you know, again, to listen to a person who uh, has been involved, uh, you know, Pastor Bernard uh, will admit that at one time he was a member of the Nation of Islam before he converted to Christianity. Um, and I would love to talk a little bit about his time in that. Um, I'm waiting for him to join in right now. And let's see, I'm going to view... If I go live, uh-oh, hold on. There he is. Oh, it says he's unable to join. Let's see. Let's try this one more time. Oh, I hope he's able to come in. Uh, let's see. Hopefully, Pastor, you can join in. Um, but if does anyone out there have any questions for me uh, about you know, I actually went um, kind of wild. I went uh, viral yesterday because one thing is I've been, you know, a lot of times when you try to have real discussions um, and then a discussion disintegrates into name calling. Um, I never have subscribed to that. Uh, I do like humor. I do like sometimes sarcasm and this kind of thing works sometimes, but when things devolve into name calling, you know, I, I, I never really respond to that. And my thing is, let me see. I'm trying to see if he's here. Um, hey, I'm Bernard. Hold on. I think I saw him. I'm, hopefully I'm not missing you, you sir. Um, let's see. Oh, well, I'm hoping, let's see if I can find him. Well, I'll just keep going until, wait, hold on. I'm, I got to look this up, guys. Oh, here, wait, there we go. There we go. Me, that was my fault. <laughs> okay, I'm like grandpa on this thing. Let's see, I invited him, he's connecting. Ah, I think we connected. Fault, How you doing? I'm doing well, my brother. How are you? Oh, this is good. This is good. I, I you know, all this technology, I got to fumble around for a little bit. <laughs> I understand it. Hey, I get it. It's okay. But I'm glad to be on this phone. It looks like we're, we're both taking some heat today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's been, uh, it's been wow. You know, you, I, to this morning, I was the donkey of the day. Ah, for Mr. Okay. Uh, Charlemagne the God. <laughs> Charlemagne you know the God, I mean? yeah. Um, 
you know, but I don't mind. First of all, people are free to have their opinions. Uh, you're free to think what you want about me. You're free to do what you want. This is why we're in America. This is what I think is one of the protections that we have, that you can have an opposing point of view. Uh, but this is where I'm, I'm a little, you know, just, just concerned in that now conversations have now devolved into name calling. And now you're not acknowledging the humanity or respecting the humanity of another person. You tend to call them out of their names and dehumanize people. And, and if you dehumanize somebody, you can do anything to them. Um, what, what do you see? Uh, and I, first of all, I, I have to say, that, can you describe some of the issues that you're having right now? Because uh, like you said, we're both sure, open and hot sure. water before. Let me, let, me, let me give some context to our relationship because when you were on the East Coast, you and Rebecca would uh, attend our church, Christian Cultural Center. And then uh, you relocated uh, to uh, the West Coast and doing the things that you're doing now. And you and I spoke right after you, the interview you did with uh, Roland Martin, uh, who's a friend of mine, and you know, to talk about the issues there. I, I, I thought it was a good, solid interview. Um, so, you know, our relationship, you and I go, go back, you know, quite a few years. Um, but I think, you know, I, well, why I'm in, I'm in hot water today? Because I purposely served the pot uh, yesterday, you know, after looking at the, the, the horror of young black children that are being killed by gun violence in our community. Uh, I felt a deep, deep pain. And I posted on uh, my social media a picture of young Devel Gardner. And in posting that picture, I explained, because there are people you know, in other parts of the country who didn't even know about this young boy in Brooklyn. Baby, one year old, sitting in a stroller in the neighborhood, and a stray bullet hits him and kills him. And he is one of some seven children, black children, that have been killed by this kind of violence in our community. So I posted it and I have been longing and even hinting about, you know, pushing conversations, nothing formal. You know, I don't have a TV show that I'm, I'm about to launch, nothing like that, because those are some of the criticisms that I got. But what I did was on that picture, put the caption explaining who this young man, uh, uh, young, young, young child uh, was. And I put a hashtag and it was hashtag black on black, not black on black crime, but mm -hmm. black on black, because I was not thinking about black on black crime, which is a word, a code word that has been used, you know, to target our communities and paint a certain uh, picture and image of, of, of blacks as being violent and hostile and aggressive, you know, and that goes back to centuries of slavery in America. But I was talking about black on black, a conversation about the issues in our own community that we can't blame the system on, that we can't blame the white man for, but that we have to take responsibility for. One of the reasons why I got involved in the Nation of Islam back in the 60s Besides the fact that I grew up in a single parent home on the streets of Bed-Stuy and, and Bushwick, Brooklyn, looking for order, looking for identity, looking for strength at a time uh, where America is going through every revolution imaginable, the civil rights uh, movement, you're talking about spiritual revolution, moral revolution, the Vietnam War and the feeding of the military industrial complex. You know, there was so much going on, music revolution, Jesus movements. And I was looking for that identity. And I was part of the desegregation program that bust us out to white schools from black community. Mm. And uh, so I grew up in the two worlds, the world that was white and the world that was black when I got mm. home. And I developed friendships and relationships, you know, in, in, in both communities, in both contexts. And it became obvious to me as uh, we call it woke today, you know, but for us, it was simply being conscious, aware, sensitive to what was happening and considering what role we would play in making change. 
So we, we organized, we, we got together when I was in high school and we pushed to have, we demonstrated some of that turned into riots because some things got unruly. There were clashes between us and the police, but we were able to bring African-American studies into the history program in our high schools across the city of New York. So I was part of, of, of that and having that sensitivity. So with the Nation of Islam and why I bring them up is because one of the things that they gave me was a sense of black pride, That's dignity. Right. And yeah. what I loved about Minister Louis Farrakhan, you know, and, and I'm talking about that context back in the 60s, uh, so I don't want anyone, you know, going after me because calling him an anti-Semitite, how could you use his name? Look, he's part of the black experience in America. And there would, would not have been a nation of Islam if it were not for the failure of the white Christian church in America to, yeah. to address the socioeconomic plight of blacks in this country. So right. the nation was a protest movement against that failure. It took the form of religious belief systems. I got it. But it taught me a sense of black pride, dignity, respect. Farrakhan spoke about the ills in our community. He talked mm -hmm. about the fact that we were not eating properly, that we need to pay attention to our health, family, and, and how we, and the black man, and the responsibility of the black man to the family. I mean, these were all values that were built into it. Yes, it also contained a mixture of scapegoating of white folks, scapegoating of Jews. That's true. Yeah. There is nothing perfect. That's why we're wrestling through this now in America. But yeah. God bless America, because I love this country because it allows us to have these kind of conversations and challenge some of the issues and hold America accountable to its values. So here we are today, and I'm saying enough with these children, these black babies being killed. So I put the hashtag black on black so that we can have a necessary conversation about issues in our community, such as poverty, health care, education. Uh, we're, we're talking about the issues of violence, the black family, the black male, you know, all of these things we need to talk about. But right. my black on black was misinterpreted through the filters of people who only saw it as black on black crime. No, I'm not talking about crime. I'm talking about a black on black conversation. So they felt it was distasteful. So, you know, I got some support and I got some attack, but you know how that is. But it achieved what I wanted. And that is to raise the conversation. I have no new movie coming out. I have no new show coming out. No, I'm pushing the conversation that we need to have within our own communities. I do believe that there has been systemic racism, that there have been issues and structural systems in the society to marginalize people of color and other minorities in this nation. I, I do believe that we have a racialized policing system, a racialized criminal justice system that needs yes. to change. I believe that there are inequities in education when it comes to the black community, inequities in healthcare, inequities in economic opportunity. Yes. But there are also the responsibility that we have of a people on how we treat each other. So that's yeah. the conversation. And it's a conversation that many blacks don't want to have because they said, well, no, that's not relevant right now. Well, when does it become relevant? Because it's an inconvenient truth. We don't want to have that conversation. So we'd rather say that anyone bring, who brings it up is demonizing. You know what? We want to be more comfortable with it. It's like, like, like white folks getting upset when, when we use the word right, white privilege in the conversation. It right, makes them feel right, uncomfortable. Yes. So they don't want to have that. So they want to change the language. Well, we can't yes. be hypocrites and want to change the language to make ourselves feel comfortable also. We need to have these hard conversations. So that's what I'm talking about. You know, Pastor, I could not agree more. You know, when I tweeted a, a, a few weeks back uh, about black supremacy, and what I said was defeating white supremacy without white people creates black supremacy. Equality is the truth, like it or not. We're all in this together. Now, woo, that set <laughs> off a firestorm. When I say firestorm, listen, I, I, I did the tweet. I went to get something to eat, and my computer was smoking. <laughs> you know? um, now, now, this is the thing, man, and, and I have to say, you know, it was to, in order to open this conversation. Now, does black supremacy exist? No. Now, in my say, when I, when I say, like, hey, 
is there this huge uh, thing where we're trying to get white people back? Well, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Is that what the Black Lives Matter is? Not at all. But, but I believe that spiritually it can. Spiritually, I believe that you can be in a mode of dangerous self-righteousness where you can feel that you are above other people. You are more important. You are better. You are, you have a supremacy mindset, which I feel is very, very dangerous. And it's extreme. And what I was warning against is extremes. The extremes of, we have people right now, I, as pastor, I have received a lot of death threats. This is what happens in social media and in the internet. There are people who are like, we need to go get Terry Crews. Somebody <laughs> needs to silence him. Somebody, you know, needs to, this is the phrase they use, somebody needs to stop him at close range. Listen, I know what those terms are. I know what that means. But this is an, an example of the extremism I'm talking about. We can't have a nuanced conversation. And this is what you are talking about right now. And Ken, now talk to me. What are your views? Because I actually said it, and I didn't even know later on that Martin Luther King actually spoke about Black supremacy being just as dangerous as white supremacy back in, 19, in the 1960s, in several speeches. So can you elaborate, or can you uh, well, yeah. tell me, hey, am I wrong? Is, well, you know, is, it, am it, I it, out it, of context it, here? What's going on? It, it begs a few questions. And Dr. King, basically, the spirit of what Dr. King was saying is that the oppressed have to be careful that once liberated, they don't become the oppressors, that we don't become like the very individuals who oppressed us. And that was a legitimate concern. But your comments beg certain questions. You know, uh, and, and the first question is, what have you experienced to give you the feeling? Because remember, you tied Black Lives Matter leading to, and, and this is the perception, because what we're dealing with mostly is perception, how people perceive what we say, all right? So the perception was that you connected Black Lives Matter eventually leading to black supremacy. Right. And I